The E.D. Nixon Research and Cultural Enrichment Series, Program 3. The theme, the Browder versus Gale Montgomery Bus Boycott Plaintiffs, Their Story. The National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University welcomes our audience to its third program in the Center's E.D. Nixon Research and Cultural Enrichment Series for 2021. The E.D. Nixon Research Lecture Enrichment Series presents two to three one-hour programs each year focusing on an important topic in African American history in Montgomery, Alabama as a whole, and at Alabama State University. The series is the brainchild of Mr. Charles Varner, longtime ASU staff member and National Center Consultant. The goal of the series is to examine an event issue or significant individual based on an original evidence presented by a scholar, a participant in, an eyewitness to, or a contemporary of an event impacting the lives of African Americans in Alabama. The E.D. Nixon Research and Cultural Enrichment Series is named for the most significant civil rights activists in Montgomery, Alabama prior to Martin Luther King Jr. Nixon is sometimes called the father of the Montgomery bus boycott. A Pullman porter by trade, Nixon played an important role in the events leading to Black's 382 day protests against bus segregation. This event lasted from December 5th, 1955 to December 21st, 1956 and brings to the surface many topics worthy of discussion even today. Nixon posted bail for Rosa Parks, the 42-year-old seamstress whose arrest on December 1, 1955, for refusing to surrender her seat to a white man on a local segregated bus, sparked Montgomery's black citizens to challenge discriminatory and abusive treatment they received from the city's public transportation system on a daily basis. Most importantly, Nixon helped form the Montgomery Improvement Association, or the MIA, and served as treasurer of the organization which spearheaded blacks' revolt against local discrimination on municipal buses. By the mid-1950s, race-based seating and other discriminatory treatment blacks experienced on these vehicles had become intolerable for African Americans who made up three-fourths of the city's bus riders. However, during the decade or so prior to the bus boycott, Nixon's courageous stand for the equal rights of Montgomery's black citizens, particularly while serving as president of the local NAACP and leader of the state NAACP chapters, had already established his reputation as the chief spokesperson for African Americans' civil rights in Alabama's capital city. Today's program focuses on the plaintiffs in the landmark legal case which overturned segregation on Montgomery's public buses, Browder versus Gale. The Montgomery Improvement Association and ASU graduate and the MIA's lead attorney, Fred Gray, initiated the Browder case on February 1, 1956. They did so in reaction to city officials' outright refusal to concede to the organization's original modest request for modifications to rigid segregationist laws and practices regarding the Montgomery city lines. These requests would eliminate several African-American bus riders' major complaints while leaving intact state and city Jim Crow segregation laws. The MIA requested, for example, that blacks be allowed to sit from the back to the front of the bus and that whites be permitted to sit from the front of the vehicle to its rear. The organization did not initially demand that segregated buses be abolished altogether. Montgomery's white authorities, however, interpreted any changes to Jim Crow bus service as a threat to the entire fabric of white supremacy. The stubborn resistance of whites to appeals of blacks for adjustments to rigid segregationist policies prompted the MIA and Gray to launch a wholesale attack on inequities on the Montgomery buses. At this point, 
the MIA and Gray charged that segregation on Montgomery's public buses violated blacks' equal rights as American citizens under the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The MIA and Gray decided against using Rosa Parks' case as the basis for their assault on segregated buses. They made this decision principally to avoid lengthy appeals of her conviction on a charge of disorderly conduct in the state's racially biased appellate process. Instead, they placed their hopes for a full reversal of bus segregation within the federal court system, which had already proved open to overturn racial discrimination against African Americans. The MIA and Gray initially selected five African American women as plaintiffs in the Browder versus Gale case. Lead plaintiff Aurelia Browder and the additional litigants Claudette Colvin, Mary Louise Smith, Susan McDonald, and Janetta Reese charged the defendants in the case, including Montgomery's mayor, William Tacky Gale, city commissioners, and other top city and bus company officials with supporting a system of municipal buses contradicting the United States Constitution. Threats of reprisals persuaded Janetta Reese to withdraw from the Browder case in its beginning stages. However, the remaining plaintiffs demonstrated remarkable courage and commitment to the MIA's and Gray's goal combining the moral power of the boycott with the legal action of the federal government level. The desired outcome was a reversal of Southern states' concerted effort to perpetuate white supremacy in every area of society. On June 5, 1956, the Federal District Court in Montgomery with Federal District Court Judge Frank M. Johnson as one of the assenting justices ruled that the city's segregated bus system contradicted the 14th Amendment. On November 13th of the same year, the United States Supreme Court validated this ruling. Montgomery Blacks reboarded municipal buses on a non-discriminatory basis on December 21st, 1956. Today's program features interviews with a son of the deceased lead plaintiff Aurelia Browder, Butler Browder, a surviving plaintiff Claudette Colvin, and Kim Jackson, the granddaughter of deceased plaintiff Susie McDonald. The interviews were designed to reveal the factors which led to the plaintiff's selection as litigants, including their experiences on city buses, the factors which helped determine their character and response to being placed under the spotlight of being named litigants in the case, and their experiences as plaintiffs, including providing testimony in the federal court hearing. Most importantly, the interviews were intended to uncover the short and long-term consequences of the plaintiff's involvement in the Browder litigation. Hello, I'm Dr. Howard Robinson, steering committee member for the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture. Our first interview is with the son of lead plaintiff, Aurelia Browder. Butler Browder. He will discuss his mother's involvement in the case which overthrew state-sanctioned bus segregation. Aurelia Browder was a mother, nurse, entrepreneur, and community activist who had experienced the injustices of bus segregation. Her deep roots in, the Bla in Black Montgomery, um, her maturity and devotion to the principles underlying the bus protest, and her fiercely hostile reaction to her own experiences as a bus rider made her the ideal choice as the lead plaintiff in the anti-bus segregation case. My name is Butler Benjamin Browder, Jr. I am the oldest son of Aurelia Browder, lead plaintiff in Browder v. Gale. Aurelia Browder was born January 29, 1919 on the Perry Hill Road to the parents of Samuel Joshua Shine and Lily B. Kazee Shine. Uh, she was one of 11, she was the seventh of 11 children. Um, she was, um, she became during her life a midwife, 
a private duty nurse, a seamstress, a uh, uh, hairdresser during that time, not a beautician, a hairdresser. These were the traits that her mother taught her. In later life, she went back to school at Jimmy Rose Adult School on West Jeff Davis, where she completed the 11th and 12th grade. During her uh, tenure, she didn't have to go to the 12th grade as everybody else, uh, as we do today. Back then, if you finished the 10th grade, it was okay, and you could go on out and work. If you intended to go to college, you then went uh, to the 12th grade in order to go to college. She, um, she went to school at Booker T. Washington Elementary, then Booker T. Washington High. But then because of the Depression, the mother took all the girls and moved to Birmingham so they could work to earn money. The boys stayed with the, the father on Perry Hill Road. Um, she went to Par uh, Parker High School um, in Birmingham. Um, okay. I've seen many books written that says that my mother was using the bus as a means of providing for her kids to get in, to take in uh, washing, uh, 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 cleaning uh, clothes and stuff. Mama didn't do that. Mama made clothes. She did not. Uh, she did not wash other people's clothes. Uh, she never worked in, in Montgomery. She never worked in anybody's house. Now, when she was in Birmingham, the family did whatever they had to do to make it. Work in the houses, uh, clean the houses, uh, deliver the babies, dress the hair, whatever they had to do to, to earn a living, they did. Um, and after, when she came back to Montgomery, she had saved enough money to buy her uh, two home, two houses on, on Hall Street. One she lived in and she rented the other to her sister who eventually bought it from her. Um, uh, my mother had us stay with her, her siblings around the city for our protection. And one of them, Lily Grant, who lived on Hall Street, she's the one that was renting the house to buy. Uh, she told Mama one day, you know, these white people gonna kill you. And, um, Mama told us something to the effect of, if you live your life and, and you aren't willing to die for something, then you haven't lived for anything. She, she was a member of the, well, I, I don't have any paperwork, but I know from the time she spent with Joanne Robinson, she was a member of the WPC. I know she was a member of the NAACP, and I know she was a member of the MIA. Um, if you look at the testimony she gave, um, she was asked the question um, um, about Martin Luther King being um, being the leader of, of the movement and all. And she said, "No, he's our mouthpiece. We hired him." I remember reading that. Um, so, and I remember many times. See, the movement effectiveness was not really with the boycott. It was with the organization of the black community. Out of the boycott grew um, what we see now with, with these uh, uh, mock ballots being passed around. They organized uh, a block captain type uh, situation here in Montgomery. My mother was a block captain Who's here. Who's they, uh, Mr. Um, I want to say um, the NAACP. Um, but I, I really don't know because I had dealings with the MIA because I used to, I was a messenger. The little little brown church-like envelopes, I used to, when she collected, I had to take them around the corner to um, Coach, um, what's Coach's name? Lewis. Lewis. Joanne Robinson and my mother were best of friends. Um, she did some sewing for Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson visited here uh, most weekends. During the week, um, when Mama would leave the house, she said, I'm going over to Miss Robinson's. Um, hardly ever did I hear her say she was going to anybody else's house unless it was a family member. So I, I can't help but believe that 
their relationship is why she became the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit. You couldn't go to court and ask for another form of segregation. The NAACP was not going to back another form of segregation. Uh, and matter of fact, the NAACP told Joanne Robinson and Fred Gray that. Um, so they had to come up with a different plan. Now, Edie Nixon's plan was to have one plan, that Rosa Parks. Joanne Robinson's plan was to have multiple plans all over the city so the, the, they couldn't claim that this was an isolated incident. Uh, she wanted people with varying stories of how they were mistreated because she wanted the case to be about uh, equal protection under the law rather than just being arrested on the bus. Now, with the plaintiffs that were selected, two were arrested by um, police officers and two were arrested by bus drivers. Well, the bus driver on the on Miss Miss uh, McDonald decided to to withdraw his authority. Now, this authority was vested in them by the city code. Uh, they they were mandated to enforce the segregation laws. But when uh, Susan McDonald told the bus driver she was where she was supposed to be, she was black, then he didn't take it any further. But interestingly enough, even though she couldn't state a claim as an independent uh, plaintiff because she did not suffer any, anything, because he didn't follow through with it, she made the case as the X factor. She represented a white person and a white person's role in the case. It showed that if she had been white, she was supposed to be in the front of the bus, and if she was black, she was supposed to be in the back of the bus. So her, her testimony really made the case for, for, for uh, the plaintiffs. Susan McDonald? Susan McDonald. As far as, okay, see my mother had more than one encounter on the bus. For years and years we heard about April 19th. And this was a day back in 1948 when the bus driver, uh, told her to get up and give her seat to somebody and she was afraid that she was going to be bumped. She was going to deliver a child. And she didn't want to be bumped, so she didn't want to give up her seat. The bus driver held her on the bus through the whole route, then took her to the bus station and released her, told her that he didn't feel like uh, going to, to police headquarters with her. And she had to walk back home. That was when she had the incentive to get her own car. She didn't use a bus when she was going to deliver a child. But on the date that she testified uh, of uh, April 29th, 1955, as I understand it, she had gotten um, paid the fare and gotten a transfer. And in the midst of that, transaction, the bus driver asked her to get up and give a receipt. She refused. And, but ultimately she was forced to get up by the bus driver. And after that, she left the bus, went to the NAACP, talked to E.D. Nixon about it, told him she wanted to file a lawsuit because she was forced to get up and give a receipt. And E.D. Nixon told her that um, because she had given a receipt, she didn't have a case. Um, but there were a lot of instances of mistreatment on the bus prior to the boycott. The boycott was supposed to solve the problem that had been going on for years and years and years. Um, I tell most people, when I think about the modern civil rights movement, I don't think about uh, the boycott. I think about Joanne Robinson's plight in 1949 mid-December 1949, when she got on the bus and the bus driver almost struck her and she got off. She went to the, to the Women's Political, well she was already a member of the Women's Political Council, but she reinvented the Women's Political Council. They told her, hey baby, there's nothing we can do about that. She had different ideas, so she became president and from that day on, she challenged the, the segregation laws on the buses. As I've previously stated, Mama went to E.D. Nixon and asked him to, to have the 
NAACP back her in a lawsuit that she wanted to file. Dee Nixon denied it. Uh, so he, he didn't, she wouldn't make a good plan. Um, she was friends with Joanne Robinson. I believe her relationship with her is why she became the lead plaintiff. But also, if you look at the law, you look at the requirements of the law, there's something called race judicata. Wherever a case originates, anything else to do with that case has to be heard by that case, by that court. Had it not been for mom's situation, none of the other plaintiffs, to include Rosa Parks, could have filed a lawsuit independently. All of them had city court matters, which would mean the case would have to go to city court, where they knew they would lose. Ms. McDonald couldn't file a lawsuit because the, the uh, Bus driver backed off on his de on his request on his demand. So it was really left to Aria Brown. The only um, unimpeachable person by the law was Aria Brown. Miss Ware was found guilty in city court. Okay. Therefore, she could not be a plaintiff in a matter before the federal court. Her anything that, that had to do with her arrest would have to go to city court. Claudia Carver was found guilty in city court. Anything that she had to do would have to go to city court. Susan McDonald, really the bus driver didn't follow through with uh, his demand, so she could not state a claim. You have to state a claim, a loss or a harm of some sort. Um, so she couldn't state a claim. Mama was the only one who had suffered a wrong or an ill or a um, defamation of character or, uh, or a person who could state a claim that was reasonable by the court. Since she had not been found guilty in a city court, she had a direct line to federal court. And what was her claim to do? That her that she was mistreated on the bus, that her rights were violated under the 14th Amendment because she was treated differently than white people. Um, so without her testimony, that could not have been a Browder v. Gale. Rita Browder was the lead plaintiff in Browder v. Gale. She was the lead plaintiff because she had the sole complaint. The, the case was based around um, equal treatment under the law, um, denial of protection under the law, um, the uh, assertion that because the, the ordinances and laws that have been passed to support segregated busing were unconstitutional, her involvement with Joanne Robinson um, and possibly the other women that were involved in her circle, prompted her to go back to school at 33 years old. Yeah. She enrolled at Alabama State with a major in uh, math and science. After the lawsuit is over, she finishes Alabama State. She applies for teaching jobs around the city, outside of the city. All the responses were the same. Yeah, we want you, but before it's over, we can't get you for one reason or the other. Finally, the, 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 the state told her that she didn't meet the requirements. She didn't have enough hours to be certified in her areas and would not give her a teaching certificate. So she goes to work at Jimmy Lee Lowe's. And she works there, and all of a sudden, around 1960, Jim Lee Lowe's comes on the attack. This is about the same time that um, Joanne Robinson comes on the attack at Alabama State. But um, for one reason or the other, uh, she was discredited or, or uh, scrutinized to the point that she could not 
um, operate the school. So she had to close the school. My mother was out of work. Well, she worked for a long time with, with no pay. Out of all that she went through, they didn't know to challenge um, teaching. They challenged the midwives. Mm -hmm. They decertified the midwives. My mother knew why. But she knew it was targeted at her. But out of all the bitterness that white people showed her, she always told us, judge a person by the person. Don't let somebody tell you about this person or that person, or don't assume that because they are a certain color, black or white, that they're going to be a certain kind of person. She, I don't think she harbored any hostility, even though she had um, been dealt with a, a, a bad hand. I don't think she harbored any, any hostility. Um, and she definitely didn't regret what she did. Our second interview is with the plaintiff, Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin was a 15-year-old Booker T. Washington student at the time of the bus boycott. On March 2nd, 1955, nine months before Rosa Parks' arrest, Montgomery police arrested Colvin for failure to surrender her seat to a white individual. Her spirit of defiance of bus segregation statutes and practices confirmed her place among the Browder plaintiffs. I just want you to talk about where you were born and your earliest recollections of your home life. Uh, where I was born. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, September the 5th, 1939. And I recall my uh, mother, uh, separated from her husband, C.P. Austin, uh, which I was uh, about a year old. And so it was hard for her to raise a, 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 a newborn baby. So she, at that time, it was a trying time for black people. It was a very hard time, and uh, for a special for a single, no, she wasn't a single mother, but a mother that was separated from her husband. And he was going to look for a job, told my mother he was going to look for, never did reappear, never did come back. So she took me to live with my great aunt, Mary Ann Carvin and QP Carvin. And uh, I don't know the exact months, but my mother uh, said I was about a year, a uh, year and a half old. And they been my, uh, those are the only parents that I knew about. So tell me about, do you remember Pine Level coming Yes, I, those were my early years. I went to uh, Spring Hill Elementary School. Pine Level. Oh, oh, Pine Level was segregated. Uh, I was in the store, and the store was called uh, uh, Mr. Adams' store. It was a general store. And it mean, it was a store, well, the reason why they call it general store, because that was the post office. That was the bus stop, and that's where you get your produce. And so um, we was in that store, and I was only going in there. I wanted some cookies, and I had my mother used to dress us up, and uh, we used to go there and stay all day because we would wait for the last person to come from Montgomery to bring us goods from Montgomery. We would sit on the bench, and when the opposite one opposite bench were one for the white people, and one for the colored people. So you didn't dare sit on the one, even though it'd be vacant for the white people, right? You didn't dare sit on that bench. And I was about six years old, that's when I started to recall these things, and remember these things. So we left Pine Level in the winter, December, and I was eight years old. I was eight years old. And so you, you will come to Montgomery from that point? See my, um, my mother's sister lived in Montgomery, uh, where we lived in the house. Uh, her, uh, her sister had left, of, uh, she owned a home, uh, 622 East Dixie Drive. That's where we would come in Montgomery. And when she died, she left it to my mother. Yeah, he was called King Hill, and my mama said, 
I don't know what other people tell you about the story about King Hill, but this is my mama opinion. You go, King Hill's is just, uh, well, the reporters call it, I don't know, use another term they use. It was the wasteland that uh, Sylvester, uh, Mr. Sylvester had bought from a seed uh, to use for his seed company. For this, he had two, had a seed company there, and he had about three silos where he on that area. And so, according to the people on Kill, King Hill, he built a row of shotgun houses called Dixon Court, and East Dixon Drive was a little row of shotgun houses, and then he divided it up and, uh, uh, for black people to own little plots of land. I uh, started at Booker T. Washington School. Oh. So, so you went to Booker T. Washington Elementary yeah, School? Yeah, Booker T. Washington Elementary School. Okay. And at that time, the high school wasn't completed. Describe for me in great detail, if you can, um, this episode with you on the bus. Talk about, is this, is this a bus route that you're, you're taking typically? or? or yes, that, we, that day, I uh, started from the school. Uh, I told them we must have gotten out of early from the school that day, because otherwise it's in the middle of the week. So we wouldn't wait. The teenagers we uh, that lived on King Hill, we don't wait until we wait until Friday when our parents have given us a dollar so we can go and browse around, put some on layaway down on Dexter Avenue, through the Capitol lawn, coming across down the Capitol lawn uh, from a Union Street. Walk from Booker T. Washington to come down across the Capitol lawn. We on Dexter Avenue. Well, I boarded a bus right there on Babbage and Dexter Avenue, right across from Dr. King's church. And when we boarded the bus, there wasn't too many people on, not too many white people on there. But as we proceeded down Dexter Avenue, more white people boarded the bus. And the bus driver looked back and saw us. And so there was a white uh, woman, not an elderly white woman, because I wouldn't have gotten up and given her a seat. And he asked for the four seats. And in order for the, uh, the white woman to sit down, four, uh, he had to have the four seats, because a white person wasn't supposed to sit in the opposite aisle from a black person. So the three girls reluctantly got up and moved to the rear and stood up, right? And uh, so, as uh, we pro uh, proceeded on down Dexter Avenue, I wasn't breaking the law. I was sitting in the seat that was provided for black people. We didn't have the removable playboys that uh, Birmingham, the play cards that uh, Birmingham have, the movable one. It was up at the top of the bus, pointing the arrow pointing to the back rear, and the arrow for white pointing uh, was to, to the front. And so that's above the uh, advertisements on the bus. So anyway, uh, the bus driver had uh, assigned, reassigned to see the call into the black neighborhood. But I would mind, remind you, even though South Jackson was a predominantly neighborhood, you, uh, you still could sit on that front row seat and that long seat on the bus. Your package could rest, the black people used to tease about it, your package could rest and sit on the seat, but you could Had to sit over empty seats that preserved for white people. All the bus systems, all the bus routes, I mean. So when, we, when the bus driver asked, she proceeded on down Dexter Avenue. He didn't ask me again. And the more white person was filling the bus, because see, we go through, I was letting you tell you, we go through a predominantly white neighborhood. So more white person are going to be on there with black people. So anyway, so when we got to uh, Court Square, it was like a little mini depot where you transfer to your buses in, but it's still a, divided, a little uh, dividing line there, where you, but you could have a bench where you could rest for the uh, next bus, right? Your uh, transfer, the bus that you transfer to. Mm -hmm. So the bus proceeded. We didn't know that we was breaking the law because the traffic cop came on the bus. He had a traffic cop first at, at uh, the court, court Square. From Bamberg Avenue to Court Square, he didn't say anything. 
but the white people was passionate as I mean, you could hear their voices, you know, shouting that you got to get up, you, that's the law and all that. They was referring to me. The white passioner from uh, the time, you know, he asked me to get up. So he proceeded on to uh, Court Square and a traffic cop come on the bus, came on the bus to the rear of the door and he asked me, Gal, why are you sitting there? I told him I paid my fare and it's my constitutional rights. And he, he yelled to the bus driver. He had no jurisdiction or here because he was a traffic cop. He didn't say that. He did say, yell that because he was a traffic cop. So we thought it was all over because I was a sitting. It's just that the, uh, the white woman wasn't going to sit opposite me. She had the whole seat to sit down and she was tired. But she wasn't going to sit opposite me. I was sitting near the window. And uh, so we said, oh, it's all over with now. Cause it cost, especially we see, he proceeded in a uh, one block the route of the bu uh, bus, uh, the bus route. He didn't, de he didn't deviate from the bus route. So, got the bill and Carmel Street, lo and behold, two traffic patrolmen came to the back of the bus and asked me the same thing. And I was more than fact, because we had been talking in the back of the, the black people had been, we weren't making a lot of noise, but we been shouting amongst us. I remember Marie Johnson, yeah, she ain't got the white girl, yeah, you got know you got to get up. You got to get up because that's the law. And Marie Johnson, yeah, she ain't got to do nothing but stay black and die. <laughs> oh, Lord. And I said, I, when she said that, I knew all the rest of them were going to, when they saw that, um, Two white patrol, I mean, not two white patrol, two police were from the squad car that the, the people didn't get off the bus and run. I knew I had support from King Hill. You know, I had support from the other students. When they saw that police, uh, two police would come on the bus and put their hand, and then the one, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the girl, they, I said, oh, I had to, <laughs> and uh, uh, the news reporter, I should have said, <laughs> I should have said that, he asked me what it felt like, what emotion I went to you through, that's what the white, that's what this, the white emotion, the white uh, news reporter is. I said, felt like Harry Duck, Tubby Hand was pushing me down on one shoulder and so John of Truth Hand was pushing me down on another. I said, history had me glued to the seat. I should have said history had all of those students glued to the seat because none of them got off that bus and ran when those two white patrolmen uh, come on the bus. Two white policemen, squad car policemen. They knew that I was going to arrest and everybody arrest all of them, you know? So they didn't, they didn't, uh, they did didn't you, jump off the bus and run. Did you resist the police officer? I didn't resist them. Know what happened? The people say I was kicking and I was scratching. I wasn't doing that. You know what I was doing that day? This is my seat. I paid my fare. And it's my constitutional right. And I didn't blink my eyes. My mom was saying, why people get scared of you when you don't blink your eyes and look at them and hold your head down? I just sit there by that window and look up at them policemen. And said, child, this is what Miss Nesbitt had taught me. And this is what Miss Josephine Lawrence had taught me. But they didn't tell me to do it that day. I didn't plan to do it that day. You know, I was planning to graduate from Booker T. Washington and go north like Harriet Tubman and free, study how to free my people. That's what I was going to do, you know. I wasn't going to. A, State teacher college to be a teacher to teach me, it's just, uh, you know, to teach me. I was going to be a rebel. I was going north like Harriet Tubman. So, so tell me, tell me what happened when the police, the police take take you off the bus. Tell me, talk to, talk to me about what happens afterwards. Oh, the police and just, I do remember this much. I sit there, and the one grab one of them, and one grab another. How I got off that bus, I do not know. And they put me in the police car. I was, they said, they said they just lift, two of them lifted me up, but I was weighing what, about 105 or something like that. They just lifted me off and threw me in the car. <laughs> and they, and they, somebody said, I don't know, some of the old crap, some of those, some of those old, the, 
<laughs> you got the right dude. Okay. Some of them were so totally, you didn't, you didn't arrest them, because I thought when they put me in the car, they going to take me to the uh, juvenile center. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they put me in the car, I didn't know they were going to take me to jail. So when they put me in the car, somebody told me they, I didn't, they didn't put handcuffs on me. And so they, I placed my hand after I got in the car through the window. And uh, they rolled the window back down. And uh, they rolled the window down. I put my hand through the thing like that. And they put the handcuff on me. And I went and it was booked in the city hall. And they were shouting obscenities. They were shouting, oh, I bet you play with boys. Cause some brass, the, the people, the police is in the, in the precinct. Cause look what size of bra cup. They was all guessing what size my bra cup was. The, the, the police is in there. They was guessing, trying to guess what size of bra cup that I was wearing. And uh, then they put me back in the uh, squad car. And they took me to the jail. And I tell everybody, oh boy, I felt like this. I was so afraid. And it sounded like when I got in there, and I didn't know that they were going to, when they locked, I told it sound like a old Western movie, you know, where they get the outlaws and they take the bandits and they put them in the jail and they throw away the key. I thought that was going to happen to me. I said, oh, the horror story coming. How long did you stay in, how long did you stay in jail? How long did I stay in jail? I stayed in jail for about three hours until my parents, my, my, not my parents, my mother and Reverend H.H. H. Johnson, Come and and bail me out. Our last interview is with Kim Jackson, granddaughter of the plaintiff Susie McDonald. 77-year-old Susie McDonald was the oldest of the Browder plaintiffs. Her long years of experiences on the Montgomery City bus line, her dignified manner, the respect she had earned among Montgomery blacks, and her sense of justice contributed to her selection as a Browder v. Gale plaintiff. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Kim Jackson and I am the granddaughter of the late Susie Coleman McDonald. But the only thing I know is that she was a very strong-willed woman. If you want to know that. She was very strong-willed and uh, when she passed away I was about 10 years old and she was still trying to you know, do what she could even though she was bedridden, but she had a very strong mind. Her career, as far as I know, she, my uh, grandfather was a rail, uh, railroad person, and uh, she just raised, tw uh, she had 22 children, uh, uh, about four sets of twins, and, uh, and she was mostly uh, at home, as far okay. as I know, yes. Wow. Uh -huh. Now, now, for one thing, I can remember, with you know, from information that I received from growing up, is that um, the people thought that she was Caucasian. She was uh, she was very fair skinned, and her hair was blonde, and she had blue eyes, and they thought that she was uh, Caucasian, but she wasn't. She was one, you know she would always would tell the other people that she's one of us. But uh, now, as far as ancestry, I don't have any more, any more information about that. So, well, I, well, age, age. When the when I think when they filed that lawsuit, they said she was probably about seventy some years old, and the other plaintiffs were a lot younger. So I probably I'm thinking that she, she had a lot of contact with the community because she always uh, was affiliated with, uh, of course. Uh, Alabama Norm, what they call it, Teachers Normal School before it became Alabama State. Did she attend? Uh, I think that's where she may have taken some of the courses. I know my uh, father, he took a few courses there and then the old Loveless uh, School. So that, you know, they were affiliated, that kind of, you know, and then plus they had a large uh, farm that um, was like at the end of Fleming Road and they would have different types of uh, gatherings for different groups of people, like maybe uh, this, maybe like maybe a, 
the blacks would have a gathering at certain times, and the whites would have gatherings at certain times. So it was, um, you know, if that's how they, she, you know, she knew a lot of people, and and I guess she just entertained a lot of people. Yeah. It was tough, it was a tough decision, but she was a person that stood for what was right. And a few times, now I wasn't around, but I was told that the house was bombed. And they did, you know, they went through a lot because of that case that they uh, filed with the uh, Ryder versus Gale. You know, I, you know, I often asked him, you know, my, my daddy and he would say, he wouldn't tell me the whole story, but you know, when you pick up bits and pieces, they said, because I used to wonder, I said, why is the house like this? Why is the house like that? And they said, it's probably because the house, they threw, a, I guess, a cocktail bomb, threw right through the front window, and it did a lot of damage to the house. I think they were in the, I think what they said, that they were in the back, back part of the house, and uh, I think the, uh, the bomb probably just uh, affected the front part of the house. So. But nobody, I know, I, as far as I know, nobody got injured. As far as I know, she did. As far as I know, I know she had written different letters. You know, she was had something like a little bit of a diary or something like that. But that, uh, you know, that was just part of the uh, discussion. But as far as, because see, I, was, I wasn't really born when that happened. So I was like four years, I came like four years after that one, after that incident. So. No, they uh, thought that she was a crazy old lady. Who thought that? The bus driver, because she was, you know, because she was fair-skinned like they were, and they thought she was a crazy old lady. Well, the now, the, as far as I know, is that they uh, used to they they used to talk about, oh, that she's nothing, she's one of us, she's nothing but a crazy old lady. That's what you know, that's what family would tell me, and I said, really? And uh, simply because she was very fair-skinned, and. Uh, and had the blue eyes and had the blonde, you know, I guess by her being 70, some 70 years old, her hair was white, so that's probably why they say she was blonde headed. So that is all that I could really recall when, from other family members, and most of those family members are deceased. So, because my oldest sister, she has the whole, she had the whole history, but she's been deceased now for a few years. And she did pass a little bit of it on to me, but not, you know, not. Not that I can recall, uh, just a very little bit. Uh, well, she would sit in the, uh, well, she knew, uh, I, I think she knew, uh, she knew everybody in the community, and she knew that more than likely, you know, by her being a housewife, folks would probably communicate like they do nowadays and say, you know, so-and-so, so-and-so, uh, they did this to her, did that, and she probably felt, she was probably furious and I don't know, she may have said something to uh, uh, the mayor, because I think, you know, they were, you know, she would talk to the mayor and all like that, so she may have said something to him about it, and, and uh, they never did pay on her mind because they thought she was an old, senile lady, so. Well, the only thing that they told me is that she, instead of her sitting in the front where, uh, where the white folks sat at, that she sat in the back. And they would ask her, come up, come on up to the front of the bus. And she would tell them, no, I'm one of, you know, she said, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm a Negro, you know. And they didn't, they, I think that's why they probably thought that uh, she was crazy because of her complexion and, and her hair. And uh, all of her sisters were the same way because they were the first, uh, well, actually the first sisters that owned that whole block where uh, the, uh, I call it the Rosa Parks Library is, you know, the Cleveland Avenue uh, li Library is. Yeah. Really? Yeah, because, you know, they weren't selling that property to uh, blacks at that time, but they acquired that property. She didn't have too much of the information. The only thing that, uh, that I could recall is that, uh, the, you know, the different letters, and, and I know that, uh, her and uh, Attorney Gray, they were they, they were very well known because my whole family they were very well known in the community. So only thing I can think of, she probably may have uh, mentioned it to the attorney, and he took it from from uh, I guess from her saying something, and then 
I don't know how everybody, you know, how everybody got involved in the uh, in the case, but I know she, like I said, she was a firm believer in, in doing what was right and uh, and you know take, being fair about things. Unfortunately, the remaining Browder versus Gale plaintiff, Mary Louise Smith, was unable to take part in this program. Her involvement in this landmark case and that of Claudette Colvin represented the cross spectrum of support the bus boycott had among the 50,000 Ameri African Americans in Montgomery, including the city's black youth. The Montgomery Improvement Association decided to include the then 18-year-old St. Jude High School student in the case in response to Smith's arrest for refusing to relinquish her seat on a local bus to a white woman passenger on October 21st, 1955. This incident occurred approximately six weeks before Rosa Parks' stand against bus segregation. As with Claudette Colvin, Smith's challenge of decades of Montgomery's violation of Black's 14th Amendment rights, despite her young age, demonstrated the daring spirit and strength of will of the individuals involved in one of the major watershed civil rights cases in the nation's history. Today's Edie Nixon program highlights African American women's prominence in the Montgomery bus boycott. In addition to the plaintiffs in the Browder versus Gale case, black women proved indispensable in the successful attack on discriminatory bus service. In fact, African American women can be credited with launching the bus protest. During the early morning hours following Rosa Parks' arrest on December 1st, 1955, Joanne Robinson, Alabama State University English professor and president of the Women's Political Council, a local activist group which had become the frontline organization confronting the unjust treatment African Americans experienced on municipal buses, along with two of her students printed 50,000 flyers in a campus building called for one day boycott of segregated city buses. The publication of these flyers motivated a new generation of activists to demand the freedoms offered to all Americans in the nation's founding documents. Dr. Janice Franklin will now bring closing remarks. On behalf of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you for your attendance at this historic program honoring the life and legacy of civil rights pioneer, Dr. Edgar Daniel Nixon. This special presentation today has focused on the important story of the Browder versus Gale Montgomery bus boycott plaintiffs. These exceptional women took a courageous stand for nonviolent social change in a landmark case that overturned segregation on Montgomery's bus transportation system. I would like to thank all of the program participants for their outstanding contributions to our lecture series. Their presentations that we will preserve have furthered our mission to serve as a research center, a living museum, and a repository of information relevant to the study of civil rights and African American culture. We also want to thank the members of our administration at ASU, our president, Dr. Quentin Ross, and provost, Dr. Carl Pettis, for their ongoing support of our center. Thanks are also extended to our historians, Dr. Howard Robinson and Dr. Dorothy Autry, along with our dedicated staff, steering committee participants, and National Center patrons. We will long remember the work of our retired steering committee member, Mr. Charles Vonder, who envisioned and established this research and cultural enrichment series honoring the legacy of Dr. E.D. Nixon. Again, Thank you all in our audience for your attendance today. And we invite you to attend future programs and activities of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture at Alabama State University. Thank you. <laughs>